Steve mentioned um, many different things, and I think one of the important points, which Danny and I were really just chatting about before the uh, before Steve uh, took the microphone, is that all of these are aspects of the same attack, and the response against them, you know, is a response against. Um, an attack which takes different forms. They're attacking K-12, they're attacking community colleges. They've attacked in the past UC and CSU, um, and will continue to. Uh, there, are, there are sharp attacks outside of education on what's related to education in the community. That's what austerity is, which they sometimes call shared sacrifice. Only who's sharing in that sacrifice? Not the banks that got 16 trillion or more dollars in bailout, you know, not corporations like, you know, the auto companies that got bailed out. So, um, unfortunately, the policies of uh, the groups that lead organizations and movements that could fight back against it are generally to collaborate in some form, to believe that we can't take this on directly or uh, have an ideology that says that we don't really want to. We need to work together with government and responsible corporations. That's been the strategy of the leadership of the two largest, uh, of the AFL-CIO as a whole, but of the largest union in the AFL-CIO, which is, uh, excuse me, the labor movement, which is not the AFL-CIO, which is the National Education Association which has three million members, used to, used to have 3.2 million members only like a year and a half ago, but you know, its winning strategy has already lost a couple hundred thousand jobs. And the American Federation of Teachers, which I think still has about 1.7 million. Together, they make up close to 40% of organized labor in this country. Now, there's an enormous amount that could be done, um, but instead, the fight has been a fight um, a collaborative in collaboration uh, with the very people who are orchestrating the attacks against them. Ani Duncan, a longtime ally of Eli Bro, the Los Angeles billionaire, who I think maybe many of you know of now, who basically was given control of the Oakland Unified School District, where I taught, um, when the state took it over 10 years ago. Eli Bro was asked to. Um, recommend and actually appoint um, de facto uh, the uh, state administrator for Oakland, first Randy Ward, um, then Kim Statham, then Vince Matthews, all of them trained in Eli Broad's Urban Superintendent's Academy, whose motto is the bottom line, the business motto for education. Broad said, it's insane to talk about running large corporations from the bottom up, and school districts are large corporations. They need to be run like large corporations. So we treat school districts like corporations, and uh, schools as profit centers, and students as revenue sources. We are bottom line oriented schools must show a profit. How do you show a profit? Increase test scores um, is, the, um, you know, is the main goal. If they don't, shut the schools down. Um, and make sure that you, uh, that you squeeze. Don't give schools what's really needed in terms of money. Don't give them what's needed in terms of resources. Point to the achievement gap. The achievement gap is real, and the fact of the matter is that schools um, in high poverty areas, and particularly in the black community, have uh, been overall um, disadvantaged and, uh, and education has not been successful there for, for generations. We had in 1954 Brown versus the uh, Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which um, supposedly was going to deal with uh, the inequality and segregation. Instead, de facto segregation has actually increased. So it's not that there isn't an achievement gap, but the fact is, and it's been known for half a century, that the root, the biggest problem, the biggest factor in the achievement gap are not in-school factors, although they certainly play a part, but out-of-school factors. In particular, poverty and poverty-related factors, and those are primarily the product of the social division and inequality in this society, the division um, by class and race, and um, 
those facts, that's been known since at least, I mean, it's been known for, forever, but there was a report from uh, Harvard University more than 50 years ago, um, which, uh, which, which found that two-thirds of the variation in student test scores, which means two-thirds, essentially, of student achievement as they measure it, were due to out-of-school factors and only one-third to in-school factors. Now, of those in-school factors, many of those are poverty-related because, for example, class size tends to be larger and, uh, and resources far more lacking and uh, far less maintenance in schools in high-poverty areas. So, uh, so rather than putting the kind of resources that are needed first into eliminating the inequality in this society, and then even to dealing with the, uh, the resources needed in schools. Instead, they find scapegoats. It's not that there are no bad teachers, but bad teachers can't explain the, uh, the main problems. Focusing on you know, trying to scapegoat teacher unions and, uh, and bad teachers doesn't, you know, doesn't deal with it. And in fact, it's well known that there are many measures that can be done to make bad teachers into good teachers, starting with decreasing class size, instituting things like team teaching, providing resources, and so on. When those measures aren't taken, you can't take seriously you know, the, um, the scapegoating, which has been in schools, like, in films like Waiting for Superman and so on, is their main, uh, is their main form of attack. Now, um, I mentioned Eli Brode. A couple of years ago, I wrote a chapter of this book. This book is called The, the Assault on Public Education. And it's by, uh, the editor is William Watkins, who's a professor of education at University of Illinois, Chicago. I wrote a chapter for it called The Neoliberal Agenda and the Response of Teacher Unions. Um, and uh, I'm not going to try to go through all of it now. I'll mention one or two things that I think are particularly relevant. I mentioned uh, Eli Broad and uh, I think his role in the business model of education, his role in attempting to uh, really foster and further privatization of education through his Broad Foundation in collaboration with uh, people like Bill Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Fishers from The Gap who have their foundation and the Walton family who own Walmart and their foundation and the Robertson Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation and the Packard Foundation and we can go through the amount of billions that have been fostered, you know, thrown into this. Well, the Broad Urban Superintendents Academy has trained several hundred senior managers, including many superintendents um, and deputy superintendents in the large urban school district. Most of the large urban school districts in the country have had Broad trainees, either running them or near the top. The first class of the Broad Urban Superintendents Academy graduated in 2002. It was the class of 2001-2002. A year later, Randy Ward, um, who became you know, the, uh, the state administrator in Oakland, named by Broad, uh, graduated. But in 2001-2002, there were about a dozen, I think there were a dozen trainers in the first class, the inaugural class of the Broad Superintendents Academy. And they were, um, you know, people like uh, Chester Finn, the noted neocon who runs the, um, the Fordham Institute, and uh, there was the head of uh, Education Trust, uh, and uh, various others, um, uh, Don McAfee from, from Houston, Center for Education Reform, leaders of the corporate agenda for education, uh, whose essential philosophy is to privatize and overall bad a public education, deny funds that are needed from public schools. Um, and uh, who, who, who else were the other trainers? There were 10 corporate trainers. Um, and that was not surprising in the, um, in the Broad Institute. But one of the names may be familiar to some of you, and maybe you'll be surprised by it, Randy Weingarten. Um, Randy Weingarten was one of the trainers for this, um, th this group imposing the business model on education and training the leadership around the country. Randy Weingarten was then president of the United Federation of Teachers in New York. Now she's president of the American Federation of Teachers. Randy Weingarten brought merit pay to New York um, five years or so later um, and, uh, and then went around the country 
um, helping to push through contracts in collaboration with school districts and with the leadership of the uh, U.S. Department of Education, Ani, now Ani Duncan. Um, and uh, when she went from uh, district, for example, the contract in Detroit a few years ago, uh, in that contract, Detroit teachers had to give back about $20,000 in salary apiece as loans back to the district. That was, you know, it, it, was, a, it, was, it was a settlement so bad <laughs> that uh, it, it was shameful. Like, I, you know, if I had more time, I'd go through it. I detail it here. Um, in fact, none of the uh, leadership of that union who went along with Weingarten were elected delegates to the AFT convention that summer. What did Randy Weingarten say about that? She said it was a great settlement, it was a model and a template. Um, and she was serious. There was a model and a template for her. She then went around to other um, school districts, Washington, D.C., New Haven, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and others. In each of these, uh, she insisted the importance of collaboration with uh, the school districts and in incorporating um, some form of test-based evaluation into, uh, which is high stakes um, uh, testing accountability, into the contract. The Baltimore, Maryland teachers voted this down and Weingarten sent a whole team in to Baltimore to intimidate them three years ago. So, um, now why, why does Weingarten act like that? And Dennis Van Roekel, by the way, the um, president of the National Education Association is not uh, what I would call a, um, a great alternative to, um, to Randy Weingarten. Why do they do this? Is it because they're venal, corrupt people? Well, I don't know, maybe they are, but, um, but that's uh, basically, they believe that they can't win, that you can't fight and win, so you have to join. And they, you have to join with your opponents, and really they don't quite see them as the opponents. You know, they've come to see it as one very comfortable way of relating. Okay. Um, much of this has occurred over the past close to half a century. Um, there was, as people know, uh, may know, there was a very big um, movement uh, organizing public sector uh, worker unions in the late 1950s and 1960s. That's when the teacher unions were organized. In New York City, which was kind of the center uh, of it, there was a public sector Virtually strike wave. The strikes were almost as dense as the strikes in the 1930s, though that's not, you know, widely known. Many of these unions were adopting, although on a reformist basis, some form of uh, attempting to embed themselves or work and collaborate with social movements. There was a uh, union of welfare workers, for example, who advocated and worked with welfare rights organizations. Um, and uh, similarly, there were um, hospital workers, um, and even for a little bit, uh, the, t the teachers' union. That was very threatening to have unions which were actually looking beyond, um, beyond narrow um, issues, because after all, contractual issues can only go so far. If you're just fighting over um, your individual locals' interest, it doesn't lead directly to linking up with others, unless there's a mass movement. In the 60s, there were mass movements for social justice. Not just the civil rights movement, though, especially, but also the anti-war and anti-draft and student movements, and those movements were beginning to link up. Um, and uh, the state was desperate to, uh, to break those up. And so um, they, together with the policies of the leadership, were successful in doing so. I don't want to get in in depth into what happened in Ocean Hill Brownsville other than to say that for nearly half a century since Ocean Hill Brownsville, um, the, uh, the uh, conflict between the um, experimental school district and board and the, um, and the union leadership, there has been, um, there's, there's been in very few instances of real unity and collaboration um, among uh, and between teacher unions and, uh, and community groups. 
And that, um, and that combined with the abject failure overall of, um, of education um, in, um, in the black and brown communities provide a target for uh, seized on by the corporate reformers in the education department and so on, saying there's an achievement gap, it's your fault, teachers and teacher unions, um, and uh, you know, parents and community join with us, you know, we're going to find alternatives. You know, charter schools, charter schools are like backdoor vouchers. They get public money, but the boards are privately um, chosen and elected. They're beyond our control, they're beyond the public's control, they're almost entirely non-unionized. Um, and uh, although some of them perform better than comparable public schools, overwhelmingly they perform worse, and that's even shown on studies funded by the charter schools themselves. So, um, we're se we've seen though, in the past two or three years, we've been seeing signs that that is starting, th that those divisions are starting to break up and that there's a basis again for developing fights. Now those fights have to be not just on a narrow union basis, I've been saying, but it has to be fights that are, that link up beyond simple narrow contractual issues in which each side works together, supports the others, and fights on a program that's fighting against austerity and for social justice. I was part of, um, uh, a group that uh, that took over an elementary school in Oakland last June, and we sat in for 17 days, I think, at Lakeview Elementary, when the Oakland Unified School District closed down five elementary schools. They shut down the schools. Um, all of the schools um, that were shut down were um, majority, overwhelmingly, black and brown. Four of them um, were um, majority African American, one majority Latino. Um, and uh, we sat in to try to prevent the, uh, the school closure. We were unable to prevent it. The police, like over 40 cops showed up to evict, you know, a group of uh, 20 sitting in um, at the school, and they had like six police agencies. The Oakland School District Police, the Oakland, uh, the OPD, the Highway Patrol, the Alameda Sheriff's deputies, um, the Housing uh, Police. Um, there was another one too, but I named five. You know, we, yeah. Well, Homeland Security actually did come around um, uh, with their well, their radar and stuff. Now, um, what did they do with the schools that were shut down? Well, let's see. One of them has been leased to, um, to Emeryville, has been basically given to Emeryville, um, which um, I think is opening, uh, Emeryville's gonna, I think, open a charter school there. Um, they're moving administrative offices into one or two, they say, um, and another two, um, they have charter schools. Now, don't think that because they say they're moving administrative offices in, that'll be the, um, you know, the end. They said that about Life Academy when they moved them out of their building um, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, that building now houses a charter school. They said that building is unsafe for students to go to school because it's not earthquake proof. They did not earthquake proof it, but they did give it to a charter school. Um, so that gives you an idea of how standards are circumvented and how, the, you know, the one example of collaboration between school management and the, and the charter schools. Okay, now, okay. Um, so, uh, but, I said that there were signs of unity. The Lakeview sit-in, actually, at the Lakeview sit-in, we did not have an awful lot of active support in the community. We had a tremendous amount of passive support, by which I mean, uh, I don't remember the last time I was involved um, in an action where there were so many cars, you know, who would come by honking their horn more and more, you know, as the days went on. There was enormous support from the community. It was the easiest. Um, place to hand out flyers, you know, I'm, I'm used to, you know, trying to hand out flyers and having people just walk by and, you know. Um, in this one, uh, it was rare to have someone, you know, turn it down. Um, there was, there, there was um, a, a understanding growing that the school shutdowns and the whole corporate agenda are not really there to close the achievement gap. They're there to batter down public education, to shut down, you know, cut back the austerity cuts and it's part of the overall attack on the essential and vital services and living conditions of the working class. Okay, um, now, 
We went to the Alameda Labor Council and said, will you guys help us out? They say they're moving a, um, that they're going to be uh, moving offices in there. We want to block the driveway. There's only one driveway into the school to prevent uh, them from uh, moving offices in. Well, the Alameda Labor Council leadership moved heaven and earth to find excuses for why they couldn't do that. And I'll be glad to detail what those were um, you know, later on. I've also written about it. That's not you know, the way to build the kind of alliance that's needed. Now, um, there's another and more recent um, example, which I think is extremely hopeful, um, uh, of the uh, overcoming the divisions. And that's Chicago, the Chicago um, teacher strike. It was clear there you had tens of thousands, you had 50,000 um, in the streets surrounding the school district at the end of the first day of that strike. There was mass support. Now that support was built um, short term and long term. There have been parents groups organizing in Chicago for many years. There have been, uh, there's been organized in the teachers union when the caucus um, that, uh, that now leads the union, the core caucus took over, they I think had um, representatives in less than uh, in about one out of every four schools. They now have representatives like shop stewards, delegates. In every school, they did a really good job of internal organizing and um, and working together with community groups and overcoming, you know, the division. I think that's important. It's not going to be um, something that moves forward from there unless um, it goes beyond. The, there was a contract. I'm not going to go through, you know, the, uh, you know, what what the settlement was. I'll be glad to do that. You know, the pros and cons from my point of view, in the discussion. But I think the important thing is that on any contract, it's essentially a truce in the class war. And the question is, how do you go beyond contractual demands, which necessarily are focused and limited on one group? Um, in education, you you know, you can make demands which really can help students too. Um, but uh, how do you go beyond that into linking up and embedding with other social movements? What can be done? One thing which I think is really important and can be done, and hopefully will still be done, although it hasn't uh, happened yet, I don't think, is to launch a national campaign against austerity, to have a conference and a campaign which I think you know, could be attracting teacher unions and groups and parents groups and student groups from around the country and also bring in activists from other movements because austerity is not something that just applies to education. And I think that that kind of a fight could be kicked off. It's something which goes beyond the limits that are necessarily imposed in a single contract fight and I think provides the basis for moving forward and taking on these attacks. Their game plan is to batter us down. They've been battering us down for decades now. There's been a huge, uh, essentially a, a pump, which has been pumping wealth from workers and the poor to the banks and corporations. Through, that's what the bailout was about. That's what these cutbacks are about. And that's what we have to fight. So to me, you know, that's where I think things can and ought to go.